When I'm looking at topics for episodes of The History Guy, one thing that I often consider is historical events that occurred on the date that an episode is supposed to air. Usually there's many to choose from because there's just, well, a lot of history. So today is January 17th, and what happened on this day in history? Well, per usual, quite a lot. And so I thought instead of doing what I usually do, which is talking about one of those events, I would cover several of them, just a smattering of the historical events that occurred on January 17th that deserve to be remembered. In 1309, Pope Clement V, to avoid political infighting in Rome and in the face of long-standing questions over the temporal authority, that is the political and secular authority versus spiritual authority of the Catholic Church, moved the papal court to Avignon, in the Kingdom of Arles, part of the Holy Roman Empire. This began a 73-year period covering the papacy of seven acknowledged popes, where the seat of the papacy resided in Avignon instead of Rome, that has since been titled the Avignon Papacy, or the Babylonian Captivity of the Papacy. The period represented significant reforms within the Church and growing influence of the French crown over the papacy and the Church generally. After more than seven decades, Pope Gregory XI, in response to declining support and influence back in Rome, moved the papacy back to Rome. The period of the Avignon papacy, which represented a significant decline in the secular authority of the church versus European monarchs, officially ended when Gregory arrived in Rome on January 17, 1377. The Antarctic Circle is a specific circle of latitude, about 66.5 degrees south of the equator, that circumscribes the southern frigid zone, separating the south frigid zone from the south temperate zone. One of the five major circles of latitude typically marked on maps and globes, the circle has a circumference of 9,900 miles. South of the circle, the sun is above the horizon for at least 24 hours, at least once a year. While the circle, referring to the opposite of the Arctic Circle, was named by the Roman geographer Marinus of Tyre in the 2nd century AD, no ship is known to have gone there or actually crossed the circle until the second voyage of exploration of British explorer James Cook, who in his logbook on January 17, 1773, wrote, At about a quarter past eleven o'clock we crossed the Antarctic Circle, and are undoubtedly the first and only ship that has ever crossed that line. There's no way to know whether Cook's claim was accurate, but as the website The History Press notes, the claim is probably technically correct in that if people had sailed across this line before, which is possible, they would probably have done so in a boat rather than a ship. His journey that far south was significant in disproving the existence of the legendary Terra Australis, a supposedly large fertile landmass south of Australia. And while Cook did not specifically discover the continent of Antarctica, he was able to presume its existence but realized that whatever landmass there was south of the Antarctic Circle would be frozen and barren. But Cook's 1773 crossing would not be the last time that the date of January 17th would ring in the history of the southern continent. One, of course, of the most prominent features of the Antarctic is the South Pole, the most southern point on Earth and the opposite of the North Pole. In 1901, British explorer Robert Falcon Scott, a Royal Navy officer very much in the vein of James Cook, attempted to be the first person to find the South Pole, although his 1901 to 1904 discovery expedition would fall short of reaching the Pole. He made a second attempt in 1910, called the Terra Nova Expedition. But there was competition. It was a period of intense interest and national pride in exploration in the Antarctic, called the Heroic Age of Antarctic Exploration, and particularly a competition to reach the Pole. Famed Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen was also leading an expedition, with the goal of reaching the Pole ahead of Scott. Both teams left on the trek to the Pole after the end of the Antarctic winter in 1911. Scott finally reached his ambition, only to find that Amundsen had beaten him there. He wrote in his journal, the Pole, yes, but under very different circumstances than those expected. Great God, this is an awful place, and terrible enough for us to have labored to it, without the reward of priority. Well, it is something that we have got here. It was January 17th, 1912. Amundsen's team had arrived there on 14 December, 34 days ahead of Scott. Scott's expedition then fell on disaster. His team would not make it back to civilization. His last journal entry on March 29th concluded, We shall stick it out to the end, but we are getting weaker, of course, and the end cannot be far. It seems a pity, but do not think that I can write more. R. Scott. Last entry. For God's sake, look after our people. 
The pole continued to be relevant for scientific study, and in 1956, the United States established a permanent base there. But still, while Scott and Emmonson had made their journey overland, most travel there was by air. In 1989, a team organized by the Canadian company Adventure Travel traveled overland in a 51-day trip to the Pole on cross-country skis. On the trip were Americans Victoria Murden, a 24-year-old Harvard University theology student, and Shirley Metz, a 37-year-old California businesswoman. They became the first women, and the first Americans, to reach the South Pole by land. They arrived at the Pole on January 17th, exactly 77 years after Robert Scott's team. While Cook had been the first to cross the Antarctic Circle, he was famous for many other discoveries and exploration from Newfoundland to New Zealand. In 1778, he is largely credited with being the first European to discover the Hawaiian Islands on January 20th, just missing our January 17th date. But the date would be important, or notorious, in the history of the islands. By 1890, the effect of European disease on the native population, as well as immigration to exploit the business interests, notably sugar, meant that ethnic Hawaiians were a minority in their own kingdom. The growing power of these business interests had forced the monarchy to make concessions, reducing the power of the monarch. In January 1893, in response by an attempt to Queen Lily Ukulani to promulgate a new constitution restoring much of the monarchy's power, a group of mostly Caucasian leaders moved to depose the queen. Despite her making concessions, the coup d'etat continued. The U.S. minister to the kingdom, John Stevens, supported the coup, even though he had not been given authority to do so. And a group of sailors and marines from the USS Boston were brought ashore, ostensibly to protect American lives and property. And while they didn't engage in any shooting, their presence effectively prevented the Queen's forces from responding to the coup. In order to avoid any collision of armed forces, Lily Ukulani yielded her authority under protest. The coup d'etat overthrowing the Kingdom of Hawaii occurred on January 17th, 1893. The committee that had overthrown the Queen sought annexation by the United States, but was opposed by the newly inaugurated president, Grover Cleveland. Opposing the annexation, and a report commissioned by him concluded that Stevens had abused his authority, and Cleveland argued in his State of the Union address that the United States had an obligation to restore the monarchy. But Congress refused to use force to do so, and the mutineers established a provisional government. In 1898, recognizing the strategic importance of the islands and fearing they would be taken by another European power, Hawaii was officially annexed to the United States and organized as a territory in 1900. The United States had become quite interested in Pacific territories as a result of the Spanish-American War, which had not only prompted the annexation of Hawaii, but had also resulted in the acquisition of Guam and the Philippines. In 1899, the United States moved to take possession of a small, uninhabited Pacific atoll that the military thought might be useful as a station for a proposed Trans-Pacific Telegraphic Cable. In 1899, under orders of President McKinley, the gunboat USS Bennington, under the command of Commander Edward Tossig, was sent to officially take possession of Wake Island. The ceremony was held on January 17th. And of course, nearly every date includes important military actions. On January 17, 1781, in South Carolina, an American force under the command of Daniel Morgan soundly defeated a British and Loyalist force under the command of British Lieutenant Colonel Banaster Tarleton. While a relatively small number of troops were engaged, the Battle of Cowpens is considered to be a turning point in the southern theater of the American Revolution that eventually forced General Cornwallis down the path that would result in his defeat at Yorktown. On January 17, 1885, during the Maidist War in the Sudan, a British column under the command of General Sir Herbert Stuart, moving to relieve the besieged British governor of the Sudan, Charles George Gordon, was attacked by a massive force. Outnumbered ten to one, the British column formed square and concentrated rifle fire defeated the Maidist army, despite a near disaster for the British when an American-made Gardiner machine gun jammed. The victory received praise in Britain and was memorialized in several poems, but two days later, Stuart was mortally wounded in another skirmish. His less experienced second-in-command, Sir Charles Wilson, was a more hesitant commander. The column arrived too late to save. Gordon of Khartoum. On August 2, 1990, the Iraqi Republic, under its president Saddam Hussein, invaded and annexed the neighboring country of Kuwait, pressing an irredentist claim to the country and in the wake of a dispute over debt incurred during the Iran-Iraq War. In response, an American-led international coalition, described as the largest alliance since the Second World War, was formed. 
A multinational military buildup, ostensibly to defend Saudi Arabia, began under the name Operation Desert Shield. A day after a United Nations Security Council resolution demanding that Iraq withdraw from Kuwait unconditionally expired, the coalition began an air and ground assault that transformed Operation Desert Shield into Operation Desert Storm, which began at 2.36 a.m. Baghdad time on January 17, 1991. I mentioned a United Nations Security Council resolution. The United Nations Security Council, the only UN body with the authority to issue resolutions that are binding to member states, is one of six principal organs of the United Nations, tasked with ensuring international peace and security. The Security Council came into existence with the formation of the United Nations on October 24, 1945. Its first meeting was held in London on January 17, 1946. On December 18, 1917, the ambitions of the United States temperance movement took form when the U.S. Congress passed the 18th Amendment, which would prohibit the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within the United States. It took more than two years for the requisite 36 states to ratify the amendment, which, according to the amendment, would take effect one year after passage. The United States officially went dry on January 17, 1920. Although the effectiveness of prohibition is still a matter of debate, the public eventually soured on the concept, and the 18th Amendment was repealed in 1933. There are many advantages to using a nuclear reactor to power a submarine. Unlike conventional alternatives like diesel-electric submarines, nuclear power does not require air, thus allowing the submarine to stay underwater for much longer periods of time. Without the need for refueling, or at least a very long interval for refueling, nuclear submarines have virtually unlimited range and the large amount of power generated allows them to operate quickly over long periods of time. While the initial idea from the United States Navy following the Second World War was to create a nuclear power plant for destroyers, the decision to instead focus on submarines is largely attributed to Admiral Hyman Rickover, who led the project to develop the world's first nuclear-powered submarine, USS Nautilus. The pioneering vessel set many records, was the first submarine to complete a submerged transit of the North Pole, the symbol of the nuclear age. Nautilus was instrumental in developing procedures for the operation and improving the future design of nuclear submarines. Commissioned in September 1954, the boat did not sail until four months later. The world's first nuclear-powered submarine first cast off her lines and went underway for testing on January 17, 1955. But of course, the nuclear age was not just about nuclear power, but also nuclear weapons. Operation Chrome Dome, U.S. plan to keep nuclear-armed B-52 bombers continually airborne in order to respond quickly to a nuclear attack, began in 1961. The constant operation had its risk, and Operation Chrome Dome was associated with six accidents involving nuclear weapons. Arguably the most dangerous of these occurred when a B-52G bomber, carrying four thermonuclear bombs, collided during in-air refueling with a KC-135 stratotanker over Palomares, Spain. The crew of the KC-135 and three members of the B-52G died in the accident, which caused nuclear contamination over about a square mile of Spain. As a result, Spain and several other countries banned overflights by U.S. planes carrying nuclear weapons. And following another accident over Greenland, Operation Chrome Dome was abandoned. A street in Palomares today is named after the date of the accident, 17 January 1966. Nuclear submarines and bombers might well be included in the concerns offered by U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower in his farewell address to the nation, which was delivered on January 17, 1961, just three days before he left office. In it, he warned about the influence of, and coined the term, military-industrial complex. Just one day, January 17th, and... I haven't even begun to touch all the important events that occurred on January 17th in history. On January 17th, 1950, robbers in Boston committed the Great Brinks robbery, at the time the largest robbery in the history of the United States and called the Robbery of the Century. On January 17th, 1929, the character Popeye appeared for the first time in a comic strip. On January 17th, 1954, a documentary called Underwater Archaeology showed in the U.S. television show Omnibus starting the television career of oceanographer Jacques Cousteau. On January 17, 1984, the United States Supreme Court ruled 5-4 to four that a person could tape a television program on a home tape machine in order to watch it later without violating copyright law in what was called the Betamax case. 
On January 17, 2017, the Three Nation Coalition that had been searching fruitlessly for two years in the South Indian Ocean for the wreckage of missing Malaysian Air Flight 370 finally suspended the search. And, of course, as a Coloradan, I can't forget January 17, 1988, when the Denver Broncos beat the Cleveland Browns in the AFC Championship game for the second year running after Cleveland running back Ernest Biner missed a chance to tie the game when he fumbled on the Denver three-yard line. Uh, an event that was so dramatic that it's still known in the annals of NFL history as the fumble. So much history. Why not make 2024 a bucket list year? Whether that means going someplace different or meeting new people or just doing something out of the ordinary, there's no better way to do that than by scheduling a trip. So why not take a trip with the History Guy? It's a great way to meet other lovers of history and to get to know yours truly, the History Guy. And we have a great trip going June 15th to the 20th to the United Kingdom where we're going to do all sorts of fun things, from exploring London neighborhoods to going down to the historic Cotswolds and Burton on the Water. We'll do clay pigeon shooting and get archery training, and there's even an optional private cocktail tasting session. What better way is there to experience the history and culture of this island, this realm, this England, than by taking a trip with the History Guy? And now's the perfect time to sign up when the year is new and your schedule hasn't filled yet. And by the way, there's still a few early bird slots available that you can get at a discount. So fulfill that New Year's resolution to make 2024 a great year and sign up today. The link is in the description. I look forward to meeting you. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.